welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. <laughs> Is I, Danielle Hallen. Oh, Dan- boy. <laughs> you don't look ready for today's episode, Danielle. You look prepared. You look very prepared for today's episode. Oh, I am. I can't smell a thing and I can hardly talk with this on. So I'll actually take it off until I get to my story. I was about to say, <laughs> honestly, I bet most of the people in my story would have loved to have one of those. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yes. And the people in my story. It's going to be one of those special episodes. I can tell already. It's just a topic that can go in so many different directions. I am totally excited for this. Oh, I'm sure you are, John. We are doing smelliest crimes or what we like to call law and odor. (laughs) Now, I didn't expect to learn so much with this topic, but it turns out that smells and crimes Mm -hmm. seem to go hand in hand. At PoliceOne.com, which is a website focused on law enforcement information and features stories from officers in the field, a writer named Motor Cop put it bluntly. He says, crime actually has a smell. Ask any cop that's been around more than a minute and they'll tell you it's true. When I stop a car and I notice an unpleasant smell, I know the driver is dirty. Not needs a bath dirty, although that's certainly not out of the realm of possibility. (laughs) Rather, I'm guilty of something dirty. When officers conduct probation or parole searches and the unpleasant smell wafts down the hallway, (laughs) it isn't a mystery what room needs attention. For landlords, if your tenant stinks and you just can't identify the loathsome scent, you may want to seriously reconsider your lease arrangement. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, some officers may very well kick in the door. Oh, absolutely. And Motor Cop doesn't mess around. But studies are also showing that witnesses can use their nose to solve crimes as well. You know how a certain smell might trigger like a long lost memory? Sure. Well, Newsweek reported on a study done by a university where the research team showed videos of violent crimes to 40 student participants while asking them to take a whiff of a body odor sample taken from the armpits of a donor. Oh, wait. <laughs> Hi, I'd like to donate my armpit smell. <laughs> I know. Well, <laughs> Yeah, there's volunteers on both sides of this. That's weird, right? But people actually volunteered to do that, smell some BO while watching a violent crime. I hope they got a free lunch or at least a HelloFresh gift card. I'm sure they at least got free lunch, John. But (laughs) afterward, the students were given five different BO samples, apparently in smelly glass jars, Mm. and asked to try to identify the right crime for each sample. And probably the craziest part, they were successful 75% of the time. 75%? 75%. (laughs) That is crazy and makes me think that I should be sure to stock up on deodorant before committing my next crime. (laughs) Oh, exactly. And what's even crazier is that 75% is a significant increase from the 45 to 50 or 60% accuracy rate of an eyewitness lineup, which I know we already think that's crazy, but... I mean, to think that your nose could possibly have more power than your eyes and being accurate. Yeah, yeah, that's insane. I mean, I've been hearing for a while that eyewitness lineups are are not very Mm -hmm. strong and eyewitness accounts, testimony, all of it. But uh, that is pretty interesting that your sense of smell is basically better than... It's like, oh, yeah. I guess the memory from your eyesight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So is the day coming when we'll have nose witness lineups? I know based on the case that I'm covering, that might be helpful. Well, experts in the Newsweek article aren't sure it would stand up in court, mainly just because of all the variables. People wear all kinds of deodorant, perfumes, et cetera. And Mm. the test subjects were asked to not wear any of that. That's true. So just kind of a clean sample of body odor. that they Pure (laughs) nasty. (laughs) Those poor, (laughs) poor volunteers who definitely deserve a free lunch. I hope you hear this, researchers, with your insane ideas. Well, uh... Okay, we learned. I'm telling you, I, l- I learned a lot. I think never the, ever would have thought that. Yeah, I think the audience has probably learned too much already. Mm-hmm. So let's continue mm-hmm. by talking about the results for our last episode, where we revisited most bizarre weapons. Danielle told the story of an eviction protest that was the bee's knees, and I told the story of several heroic citizens stopping a crazed attacker by grabbing their balls. Mm-hmm. And we had a strange outcome. How did it all play out, Danielle? All right, so. On Twitter, 
I received 78% of the votes. John Ooh. received 22%. That is, that's like a big, Woo. it is. But a on the web, yeah, but on the website, <laughs> interestingly enough, I received 47% of the votes and John received 53%. Oh, I'm a, I'm a winner. Yeah. I win. But when stuff like that happens, which you guys, it does not happen very often. It's like a handful of times. Yeah. We have to go to individual votes. And okay. by only 10 votes, I ended up winning. Oh, come on. Recount. Recount. <laughs> No. <laughs> I'm telling you, I think it wow. really, I swear this only happens when we find very different stories and it like yeah. forces you guys to be torn <laughs> and you're like, I don't know what to do. Usually there's like some similar element that kind of stacks us against each other in that way. That's true. And our, those last two stories, totally, completely different. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I wonder if we're going to have the same type of thing happen today, but uh, Danielle, sounds like you are keeping the mug. You're holding on I to know, it. I know. I am. I'm holding on to it. It needs to be washed. All right. I'll pretend there's tea in it. <laughs> there it is. All right. Well, let's see what happens with today's stories. Let's get to our first about smelly crimes told by the super talented and very nice smelling Danielle Hallen. I like to think so. Stuff yes. like that kind of makes me a little crazy. Well, I now sat listen. next to you at CrimeCon. So, yeah, I know. <laughs> You're like, it's okay, guys. She smells <laughs> fine. Yeah. Now... I was nervous going into this because I was like, there's no way there's a lot of crimes that involve some sort of smell, stench, what have you. And like, obviously the first thing that goes into your head is the very dark side of crimes. And when I tell you, I am shocked at every one of you out there, <laughs> <laughs> the amount of stuff I came across is so wildly disturbing. I could have researched into this for days, but I found one story, you guys, and it just takes the cake. So 59-year-old Gerard Finneran was an incredibly successful, well-respected man, you guys, very well-raised. He went on to become a member of the very first graduating class of the U.S. Air Force Academy. So that's pretty cool. You know, this awesome. guy is like an outstanding guy. Yeah. He excelled in athletics, um, intellectually. Growing up, he was top tier. And later on in life, he decided he wanted to settle into a career. And so he went and got his MBA from the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business. Now, he worked in a handful of different banks after he did this, ranging from Drexel, Burnham Lambert, Citibank, um, and then ended up managing um, or in a position managing uh, the trust company of the West. And he was working very specifically towards becoming an expert in third world debt, focusing on Latin America. So like you're hearing this and you're like, oh, yeah, absolutely outstanding guy has everything together. You know, there's no way he could just totally fly off the handle. <laughs> <clears throat> well, hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> now, Gerard was a man that loved to travel. And so he wanted to see the world. And th his job kind of gave him that opportunity because he was, you know, specifically looking into third world debt and all these things. It was what he had a passion for. And also, when you're in that kind of job where you're just day in, day out at a desk in front of a computer with a head filled with numbers, vacations are much needed or business vacations sometimes can turn apparently a little bit wild and gerard seemed to let loose a little too much okay even for a man with so much going for him he can show his hind end from time to time literally uh -oh. so okay you're like oh no <laughs> yeah i don't so, like where it's going let me yeah. just put that out <laughs> <laughs> it's not going a good direction. Okay. So October 19th, 1995, United Airlines Flight 976 was scheduled to fly out from Manisto, Manistro, Pistorini. There's a lot of things I'm going to have trouble pronouncing. International Airport. And the flight would land the following day of October the 20th at John F. Kennedy International Airport. Now, Gerard had been visiting, and I don't know why this is a tongue twister for me, Buenos Aires. Why? That's right, right? Nailed Buenos it. Yeah, you nailed it. There's like a part of me that wants to roll that R so bad. And so yeah. I have to like tuck it back in. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where he was going on a business trip with his co-worker, Susan Bergen. And they both had first class tickets on this flight 976 for their return home. Now, you would think that this would be a fabulous experience. Now, I personally think no matter where you sit on an airplane, it's absolutely terrifying. But, you know, you've got more space. you got more amenities. People are kind of waiting on you a little bit more. But mm -hmm. Gerard seemed to take this freedom and luxury to an entirely new level. And the issues that he would cause started before the flight could even take off. Okay. And fellow passengers had absolutely no idea what the next 11 hours were going to be like. 
So Gerard boarded the plane, settled into his roomy seat at 10B. So he's like the last seat in first class. And as the passengers are still boarding the plane, Gerard decided, you know what? I'm going to kick off this flight after this successful business trip by having a couple glasses of champagne. It's like nothing, nothing. I know, like nothing out of the ordinary. Yeah. But it was obvious that he had already been drinking. And so things very quickly start to go downhill. So after tossing back both glasses, the plane is still grounded. Like he's literally just knocked these suckers back. He kicks things up a notch. So Sharon Manscar, who was a flight attendant, she was on the plane. She's hanging coats in the closet, still like welcoming people on. And all of a sudden she hears someone screaming from first class. And while it sounded like an emergency of some kind, when she finally like heard what was happening, far from it. It's Gerard. He's at a seat and he's saying or demanding, quote, I need another glass of champagne. Okay. <laughs> so she's like, great. We've got an unruly, an unruly passenger here. So taken back by his demands, you know, she gathered herself and she's calmly saying, like, look, I'll be right with you when I'm done. I just have to finish my current task. Everything will be fine. But Gerard was apparently feeling a little impatient and decided to take matters into his own hands. So he proceeds to make his way through the aisle. There's another flight attendant that is dealing with pouring champagne glasses for other first class passengers and other passengers coming in. He just reaches right on over her and grabs a whole champagne bottle. Wow. Nice. (laughs) You're like, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Now, unfortunately... This bottle was empty. Well, unfortunately for Gerard. (laughs) So he's like, you know what? I'm going to continue on this mission. So he just walks right past her into the galley of first class, like full on goes into the galley and starts going through everything and finally finds two pre-filled glasses of champagne meant for other passengers and picks them up and starts to leave with all of this in hand, this empty bottle, these two champagne glasses. And so Sharon, who's like trying to find him at this point to see why he's screaming about needing champagne. She comes in at the tail end of his adventure and she ends up persuading him to put the champagne bottle down. She's like, okay, I got to keep this cool because we don't want to push this guy any further. We've literally not left the ground yet. Wow. And so she takes this champagne bottle from him and locks it into a cabinet. There's another champagne bottle that's actually full, locks that into a cabinet. And it's like, look, I understand you want to have alcohol. You want a refill of your beverage, but It is illegal for you to pour your own alcohol on this flight. If you need something, you know, I assure you, all you have to do is ask and be patient and we've got it. And so she's like, look, time to lift off, go back to your seat. Everything seemed calm. Gerard was sitting happily in first class, sipping his two new glasses of champagne. But like all good things, those glasses came to an empty end. Shortly after takeoff, like literally probably like less than 30 minutes, he signaled to another flight attendant and ordered two more glasses, except this time he's like, you know what? We're switching to French red wine. Ooh, yeah. They need to they need to <clears throat> cut him off at some point. And of oh. course, that's not going to go well, I'm sure. <laughs> no, not at all. And we're an 11-hour flight. <laughs> mm. So at this point, however, I don't think that's really what the crew was focusing on. They're like, okay, well, at least he asked this time. <laughs> Right, right. (laughs) Like, you know, he's asking to have two glasses of red wine instead of just going to get it himself. And so they bring him these glasses. They're like, all right, maybe his self-serving escapades over. But they could also tell, you know what? He is getting pretty intoxicated. Yeah. And it seems that this created his desire or this caused his desire to come back. And so once again, they're soaring over the open ocean. Flight attendants are doing their rounds. And one of them walks into the galley. And who's there? Mm. A drunk Gerard just rummaging through the cabinets again. Now they reminded him again that there's protocol. You can't pour your own drinks, hoping he would put the bottle down just like before, apologize, go back to his seat. But instead, like a toddler who found a stash of candy, he took it and ran back to the seat, bottle in hand, sat in his chair and shoved the bottle between his legs. Like, na 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 boo boo. <laughs> like, yeah, it's mine. <laughs> don't touch it. That is not yours. <laughs> And so they're like, okay, we got a problem here because like, we're not about to go and play tug of war between this, like (laughs) this bottle of wine between his legs. Like we've got to figure something out. And clearly he has absolutely zero interest in following our orders. And so the situation's escalating and the supervisor's like, you know what? We need to cut this guy off. At this point, it had been at least a couple of hours into the trip. And they're like, you know, he's at least had 
six glasses of wine. Now he could have been sharing some of these with the woman that he was with his business partner. We don't know. Um, but they're like, you know, his behavior, just a little belligerent, it could create a lot of problems. So they sent a male attendant to inform him like, Hey, you're not having any more alcohol for the remainder right. of the trip. Yeah. Ensue total chaos. Mm -hmm. Gerard immediately flew out of his seat into the aisle, screaming obscenities. He's threatening the flight attendants, um, you know, who obviously have just brought him the worst news he's ever heard. And so in hopes of, de <laughs> I'm serious, in hopes of de-escalating the scene, the supervisor had to come and take over and calm him down because they're like, this is getting out of hand. Like, we don't want to have to make unexpected stops. Like, I need you to sit down and relax. And he would occasionally sit down, but then he'd get right back up. He actually prevented one of the crew from responding to a medical emergency further back in the plane because he just thought that his need for alcohol was you know, more important. Wow. But they're like, you know what? The crew's like, we're going into mealtime. Like we're about five hours into this flight. We've got five or six hours left. Mealtime's coming. Maybe if we feed him, like he'll sober up a little bit or at least pass out, like just go yeah. to sleep and stop acting like a fool. And so they started handing everything out, gave Gerard his meal they head on to the next row, which is row 11, which is right past first class, close the little curtains to give them their privacy. And they're like holding their breath thinking, okay, everything from this point on will be fine. But Gerard had absolutely zero interest in food. Like they could not even fully serve the people in the following row before Gerard had snuck off from his seat. Of course, okay. nobody's noticing this because they're all back trying to feed everybody else. Yeah. Now, meanwhile, Sharon, the poor flight attendant that had first initially had contact with him, she is finally taking her rest time. There is a rest time required for flight attendants on international flights. And so she's, you know, like right by the galley, right outside of first class in her own little seat, taking a break. And all of a sudden she's like, why is my seat shaking? Like, what is going on? So she stands up and goes to open up her own curtains to look into first class and gets smacked with two hands out of nowhere, just right through the curtains, grabs her and shoves her. It's freaking Gerard. Uh-oh. This is turning really, really oh, absolutely. quickly. Yeah. So she's like, what is going on? Beside herself, trying to pull herself together in her brain, she's like, oh, he's here to get more alcohol. Like, we've got... A huge issue and so she turns to look at gerard who is now in the first class galley and she realized he's not here for a drink okay instead he in wants dinner view of the entire first class passengers he had crawled up onto a serving cart pulled his pants down and took a massive crap top of the cart what before wiping himself with the linen napkins meant for <gasps> the dinner meal what like full hind in out toward everybody else on the plane oh my god you wish there was the an air, air taking a poop <laughs> yeah you wish there was an air marshal on that flight man take that guy down cuff him like that's insane and just like a child just like before he wipes himself with this linen napkin, pants down, takes off running to the nearby bathroom where he locks himself in. Oh, my God. Well, they have ways to unlock those doors. Sharon said, in a quote, there was feces everywhere. Oh, my God. You guys, not only was it all over the cart of the initial attack, but he had left a trail like on his shoes when he was running through the rest of the cabin to get to the bathroom. The, the <laughs> You're like, no, no, it's gross. Rose napkins were all over the floor. He had somehow managed to smear it all over the walls. You guys, it Whoa. was everywhere. Tantrum. Immediately, the captain's obviously notified, right? Yeah. They're like, oh, heck no, we got to get this plane down. Like, we have to request an emergency landing. Wow. The entire cabin at that point was just the overwhelming smell of someone's crap. Oh, and yeah. Gerard, yeah. It's, it, it recirculates. It's just recirculating poop air through the yeah. whole entire plane. Yeah, if you've ever been on a plane when someone has gotten sick, 
and oh. have, have noticed how that smell just propagates it through the whole cabin. Away. Yeah, that's insane. And so they're like, he's still locked in the bathroom. We don't know what else he's going to do. We got to land this plane. And so they put in a request for an emergency landing. Denied. Oh, what? <laughs> what? The I didn't know you could. Des- the Portuguese president and an Argentinian foreign minister were on board of this airplane. Oh, my God. Wow. And making an unexpected landing posed an obvious security risk. Like, they have to plan for these things way ahead of time. Yeah. And so their security is like, nope, not happening. The security down, I think it was like San Juan or somewhere. They're like, nope, this isn't happening. And so they're like, you just have to make it through the four or five hours left of this flight. (laughs) So the crew is now like, what on earth are we supposed to do? So they go back to Gerard's seat where his coworker is. Her name is Susan. Bless this woman. Bless her. They're like, look, this is what your coworker has done. And we are literally begging you to come and help us. Like, we need you to come, encourage him to come out of this bathroom and help us find a way to keep him calm for a remainder of the flight. We've already tried to land the plane. They won't let us do it. Like, you've got to help us here. And so she heads over there. Meanwhile, the crew is working to unlock the bathroom. And finally, the door opens. Gerard has now managed to also cover himself in feces. Oh, my God, this guy. It can't, this can't just be alcohol. He's got to be doing something else. This is insane. Susan grabbed him by the hand, which I'm sure was not a pleasant thing. Yeah. And like calmly guided him back to the seat and literally like cuddled this man to help him fall asleep. Like rested her head on his shoulder and like held him in the seat covered in poop. Oh, something's wrong. And so he went to sleep. And according to Sharon, quote, the stench was overwhelming. At this point, they're on full on damage control. This man has finally just passed out in his seat, but there's still poop all over him. They're cleaning what they can on board, but they just don't have the proper tools to clean it like they should be able to. It smelled so bad that they started just like piling blankets on top of Gerard and hopes that it would cover the smell up. Other passengers are nauseous. They're complaining you know, that they can't escape the smell. It won't go away. The crew was walking up and down the aisles for the rest of the five hours, spraying any perfume or cologne that they had on them to try to mask the smell the best that they can. Mm. And not only were passengers angry about the smell, but the entire rest of the cabins, like it, their mealtime was canceled. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. They had to cancel food service due to unsanitary conditions. And keep in mind, the crew only made it past first class so the entire right. rest of the plane was starving through all of it. <laughs> like i wouldn't know if i was hungry or wanted to throw up for like the rest of those five hours and on top of that they also had the crew they were like no more rest breaks like we know they're mandatory but we don't know what this guy's gonna do if he were yeah. to wake up like yeah. we need all hands on deck and like when it came to the meals too like gerard apparently had just touched every single utensil he could possibly reach in that short time span <laughs> It was literally just like poop on everything. Mm. Mm. What an absolutely miserable flight. And everyone just had no choice but to sit there in this the entire time. Meanwhile, he is just sleeping like a baby. Well, Danielle, I mean, you have to say about this guy, he knows how to celebrate. He's celebrating that big deal. He's cracking some champagne, cracking a crap. Exactly. Just (laughs) living his his best life. Yeah. Taking a nap. Taking a nap. <laughs> and a finally, crap nap. he had a crap, crap nap. Now, finally, in the early morning hours of October 20th, the plane landed, and obviously, Gerard was immediately arrested by the FBI. Oh, <laughs> They're like, "This is what on earth?" He was facing charges of interfering with a flight crew, yeah, um, insulting and intimidating flight attendants, and he was thrown in jail. Now, he pleaded not guilty. He posted his one hundred thousand dollar bond with his large bank account that he had, and he also mm-hmm. was able to hire a well known lawyer, Charles Stillman. And it was also noted in his terms during all this that he would have to attend an alcohol counseling program because they were like, what in the good googly moogly? Yeah. 
And yeah. he also was no longer allowed on any more flights unless the court gave him permission, which they were probably never going to give him permission to do that. I hope they drug tested him I, or I, or he has like severe alcoholism. Like, I mean, that type of behavior is just not, you're not coming from not. a right place. Yeah. No. yeah. But do you know what their excuse was? What? So Gerard and his attorney seemed to have a perfectly plausible explanation for what really happened on this airplane. Okay. So they're like, you know, Gerard, he did in fact enjoy a couple of drinks. Like, yeah, of course. Lots of people do that on, on flights. But this had absolutely nothing to do with why he took a crap <laughs> on this cart or why he like pushed this flight attendant, whatever. And so instead, Charles Stillman was like, the crew were so focused on complaining about his drinking and, you know, the wine that he was taking that they ignored a, quote, dire medical emergency that he was having. Having What? What? Th he was having a stroke? Traveler's diarrhea. What? what? Traveler, traveler. They were like, no, you, this airplane is just so awful. And they did not pay attention to his medical emergency. He was experiencing traveler's diarrhea. And they did not do right by him. What were they, they like, supposed this is to do? Actually, the plane's fault. So I guess he was trying to say, despite all the witnesses claiming otherwise, he was trying to say that he had been, he wasn't actually trying to push his way through to go and get alcohol, that he actually just had to go to the bathroom. Oh, and he said great. that there was security on the plane that was not allowing him to use the first class bathroom. And I don't know whether he's saying, oh, they wouldn't let me because they didn't think I was in first class or, you know, honestly, they probably, if that is the case, didn't let you because you had gone into the galley two times at this point. Yeah. But he's like, no, I just had traveler's diarrhea. It was totally out of my hand. And, <laughs> and, and I couldn't do anything about it. And I just like have sat here and thought about this. And I'm like, how dare you say that they're ignoring your medical emergency when you literally prevented the crew from in a timely manner getting to an actual medical emergency on the plane because you wanted to stand there and scream. But now you have the audacity to say like, no, I have a medical emergency. Yeah. I didn't know that there was a medical condition known as traveler's diarrhea. No, I mean, there's <laughs> definitely unaware. some questionable things that can happen in your gut area after you've gone to like, you know, sure, sure. had certain fruits from certain places. And like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, but Okay, so you're like, you have traveler's diarrhea. So, okay, you shoved a woman trying to get to the bathroom, but you didn't go to the bathroom. You went to the cart. <laughs> you literally went to a cart and pooped on it. What a story. Now, a obviously, the publicity on this case, field day. Okay, no one's yeah. letting Gerard live this down. And he actually became like hilarious headlines all across the country and even made it on David Letterman. Mm. who read off the, quote, top 10 Gerard Fennerin excuses, consisting of, quote, oh, like, you've never done it before. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think anyone really has. I, no. <laughs> I could almost guarantee you're one of, like, the very few people. Mm. And, quote, misread brochure about advantages of first class. <laughs> I mean, they were just going in on this guy. And I'm just like... Ugh. There's a point where you're like, okay, there's there might be something deeper going on here, but it's also like you are how old? Like you're in your 50s, okay? Come on. Like and I like, wouldn't I wouldn't take any excuse outside of a medical like a major medical event. Exactly. Like he was having a stroke or something. Exactly. Yeah. Like there's something clearly going on, but he had a history of this entire flight, like before this flight even had a chance to get off the ground. Yeah. So it was rough. Now, he ended up pleading guilty to only to threatening a flight attendant. Um, and I will say a bit more of like the truth, so to speak, came out. He did admit that he had been drinking a lot and that he was, in fact, angry that they had cut him off, which we all knew based on every witness that was there. Yeah. Um, and he said that did lead him to act out of character. But he still seemed to stand by this idea that he experienced traveler's diarrhea. Like, And I find it, I find it so interesting because I think he was so embarrassed by what he did. He's like, oh, I would much rather admit to like pushing someone than the fact that I literally popped a squat in the middle of an airplane in front of everyone. So, yeah. um, but yeah. regardless, he ended up paying a $1,000 in cleaning costs to totally clean the plane of his giant mess. He also, um, get this, had to pay $48,000 to Ooh. reimburse 
every other passenger on the flight. Oh, nice. They had to sit there and suffer in that for yeah. five hours. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. The I longest, like I think the longest ride I've ever been on a plane was like four and a half hours. Yeah. And like, it was the end of the world. And like, as someone who has like anxiety over that, if I also had to smell that, they would have to emergency land the plane to get me some medical assistance because yeah. I would just not be well. Um, and he also ended up with 300 hours of community service, two years of probation and a $5,000 fine on top of that. And he was permanently banned from the ability to drink while flying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the problem. And I've seen, yep. I've, I've literally <clears throat> seen, um, them deny boarding to people because they had had too much at the airport. Exactly. But and imagine that's why they have up. to watch it. Exactly. Yeah. You're up in the air. Like there's only so much you can do. You don't know the kind of threat somebody is going to pose and people will do all sorts of crazy things from yeah. being highly intoxicated. Yeah. And cutting them off is never going to go well. No. So mm -hmm. that's part nope. of why I think they have to be so strong about mm -hmm. watching for it on, in the boarding process. Like, oh, could this person, but you know, with first class, they're probably, they're probably not as stringent no. about watching those people. It's like, no. oh, they're first class. Yeah. Wow. Oh my goodness. But he did say that he promised he would never do anything like it again. <laughs> mm. So that's good. <laughs> well, in honor of him, yeah. anytime I use the bathroom, I will now say I'm going to take a Gerard. Yeah, taking a Gerard now. <laughs> I mean, oh, I'd be so embarrassed. And like, yeah. I feel like when you're intoxicated to a certain extent and you like wake up the next day and you're like, what did I do? But like, usually that's like, oh, I texted someone. Oh, like I you know, this, that, and the other. I woke up with a bruise. I smacked something. Imagine being like, oh my God. Yeah. I pooped yeah. on an airplane. <laughs> but then trying to fight it, then I'm, yeah. I'm going to hire a, the best attorney I can. We're going to come up with an excuse about my medical condition. I mean, come and, on. Well, and, and, and honestly, a very distasteful excuse considering the fact that he himself blocked them from helping a passenger with a real medical emergency. Like, come on. Yeah. Yep. But that's, that's really disgusting. And if I had been on that plane, I would have pulled the emergency exit and jumped out. I would have been like, <laughs> nope, done. Open it. Let me go. I'm just going. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, we are over the ocean, right? I'm just going to exactly. jump out right here. Jumping out. See you. And Gosh. I need a bath. So it, yeah. For real, works out. <laughs> Huge thank you to the Smoking Gun, Chicago Tribune, Newsweek, Wikipedia, and New York Daily News for that mess of a story. Wow. Wow, Danielle. Yeah. I think you've you've given nightmares with that one. I think people are have. have bad dreams I, like, over that. I've been thinking about flying. Like I literally am already like thinking about having to get on a plane for crime con in September. I'm like, okay. Oh, mm -hmm. You're gonna think twice. Unlocked. You're gonna think twice when you see that cart come down the aisle. Yeah, I'm gonna be freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, way to start off the stinkiest episode we've ever done, Law and mm -hmm. Odor. Let's see if I can round it out with a story of my own right after this short break. The best smells in my kitchen happen when I open up a box that says HelloFresh on it and start cooking. March is National Nutrition Month, and HelloFresh makes it easy to choose delicious, dietitian approved meals. Simply look for the dietitian win tag on their menu choices for meals under 700 calories and with one third less sodium. Yeah, and for anyone struggling with their blood mm -hmm. pressure, which I actually have, that less sodium indicator, yep. super, super helpful. Uh, I hope that dietitian win tag program keeps rolling because yeah, I would too. certainly love that. Uh, this week, I made HelloFresh's version of one of my fast food favorites. It's called the Black Bean Burger Crunchy Wrap. It was, it was kind of fun and just mm -hmm. really satisfying to pull it off, but the best part by far was the taste. They, they, they somehow, they one-upped my fast food fave. That's all I can say. It's, it was amazing. And you guys, that was just one of 40 weekly recipes John got to choose from. Recipes for all meal occasions, lifestyles, and preferences. HelloFresh makes it easy to eat what you love. Customize select meals by swapping proteins or sides, or even adding protein to a veggie dish. They're the best. It's mm -hmm. literally just that simple. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime60 and use code CrimeAfterCrime60 for 60% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash crime after crime 60 and use code crime after crime 60 for 60% off plus free shipping. 
Try America's number one meal kit today. And if you can get that crunchy wrap, get the crunchy mm-hmm. wrap. <laughs> like, do it, please. Super good. <laughs> All right, you guys, welcome back. John's been talking up his story, so I'm ready oh, yeah. for it. Oh, yeah. I've always got to try to intimidate her because she oh. just kicks my butt month well, after also- month. On top of that, too, I feel like doing all the research, I'm like, I didn't realize how many different ways this could go. (laughs) This can go so many ways. And I had never thought about it before. So I don't have any idea what to expect from you today. Oh, yeah. I Well, I had to dig deep, but I I think I I came up with something that everyone here will appreciate. When researching today's story, I found out that sometimes a legend is so big that it takes more than one person to step into those shoes and assume the role. Oh, man. Sort of like how the Black Panther mantle has been handed over in the film Wakanda Forever. This can also happen with the names of supervillains. Today, I'm covering the legend and legacy of Bob. Wow. The body odor bandit. (laughs) What a name, Bob. Mm -hmm. Bob, body odor bandit bandit. The earliest reference I can find for this moniker is from way back in 1966. It was March in San Angelo, Texas, when a young man who was casually dressed walked into Gail's shop just after noon on a Wednesday. He pulled a gun on a woman working there and demanded cash. She scooped together about $100 and she put it in a pink bag, which was noted. It was a nice little cute Mm -hmm. pink bag. She hands it over. Three witnesses were in the store at the scene, and they said the most distinguishing thing about this young man was his terrible case of body odor. Imagine, Danielle. It was so bad that their visual memory of being in a traumatic Mm -hmm. event, like having a store robbery happen around you, was wiped, but everyone could remember. (laughs) Yeah. Ooh, that smell. The smell that surrounds you, his terrible B.O. According to the Cleveland Clinic, body odor is caused by a mix of bacteria and sweat on your skin. Sweat itself doesn't smell, Mm -hmm. but when that nasty bacteria on your skin mixes with your sweat, it causes an odor. Body odor can smell sweet, sour, tangy, or like like onions. (laughs) I was waiting for you to say it. This whole, I'm like getting itchy. Oh. I'm going to have to shower. (laughs) Jeez, Cleveland Clinic. Do we have to be so descriptive? I did not like the descriptive word of tangy. I will tell you that right now. (laughs) Tangy. That was awful. (laughs) Tangy. And and then to follow that with tangy or like onions. (laughs) (laughs) I know. It's awful. (laughs) The amount you sweat doesn't necessarily impact your body odor. That's why a person can have an unpleasant body odor but not be sweaty. Your body odor can change due to hormones, infection, medications, or underlying conditions. Other factors that can affect body odor are exercise, stress, or anxiety, which we're Mm -hmm. talking about robberies here, Yeah. Uh, hot weather, being overweight, genetics. I think they're missing one here, but I'm going to add it. Bad hygiene, maybe? Yeah, that's probably a big one, I would assume, with the bacteria situation. Yeah. Uh, your BO is also affected by sulfur-rich foods such as onions. There's that word again. <laughs> Keep it together for the episode. You've got this, I believe. Garlic, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, red meat, and other foods like MSG, caffeine, spices like curry or cumin, hot sauce or other spicy yeah. food, and alcohol, which means, Danielle, I must reek because I yeah. love a lot of that stuff. Me too. <laughs> I make curry all the time. Cumin's probably my u- most used seasoning. Oh, I'm I a hot smell sauce. like a walking Red Bull can at this point. Yeah, I'm a hot sauce monster. Like I, I'm at the point where hot sauce is on everything I'm eating. But garlic, oh, yeah. cabbage, Delicious. broccoli. Garlic, I, oh yeah. I'm a vegetarian. Like they're hitting mm-hmm. my list. After the 1966 appearance and the B.O. bandit name rested for a bit, Uh, In 1991, it would come back with a stinky vengeance, this time in beautiful Oceanside, California. The North County Times reported in July of 1991 that a dozen banks in the local area had recently been hit by a robber the FBI named and was calling the B.O. Bandit. That says something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, (laughs) when you get the FBI to slap a name like that on you? Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Some investigators even shortened the name further, referring to the robber as Bob. Bob, 
a white man with sandy hair and a mustache that stood at about six foot three, used the same approach in most of the bank robberies, standing in line and waiting for the next available teller, just like a, a nice person would. Mm -hmm. Then presenting a note to the teller, the notes typically said something like, this is a robbery, I have a gun, I want money. Bob, he's very to the point, Danielle. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And then he takes the money and he puts it in usually a container that he actually brings in with him. And then he flees on foot. Now, some reports refer to the odoriferous. <laughs> I wanted to say odoriferous, and I don't think that's the right word. Odoriferous outlaw. Odiferous. There it is. Odiferous. <laughs> I knew it would come out if I tried enough times. Yeah. Good job. Uh, the odiferous outlaw as possibly being a vagrant due to his appearance and, of course, that special smell of his. Absolutely. F FBI spokesman Gene Reel said several witnesses said statements to the effect that he smelled like he really needed a bath, he reeked of cigarettes, things like that. But despite Bob pulling off so many heists, law enforcement, they were having trouble sniffing him out, Daniel. Not surprising. FBI agent Jack Kelly told the press that while the initial robberies noted his foul smell, the name that the FBI gave him must have had some effect because in his later robberies, the thief's personal hygiene seems to have improved. Oh, Quote. man. <laughs> wow. Imagine that being it. Imagine you being yeah. so proud that you just robbed a bank and then you're like, yeah. what are minute, they calling me? Smell that? <gasps> the what? Yeah. We have a quote from Jack Kelly here. Uh, obviously... He's got some money now to clean up his act. Yeah, that's true. Uh, mm -hmm. How much money Bob actually stole wasn't made public, but Agent Kelly would say he's not a record breaker, but he's becoming rather prolific. He's getting a substantial amount. However, one month later, newspapers would report that the man they believed was California's body odor bandit had been captured. A witness named Donald Pardue saw the robber while he was fleeing one of the banks. He ran to a 1977 Dodge van in Avon's parking lot, and the witness wrote the plate down. What an amazing eyewitness. I was about to say. Yeah. Eyewitness saw, coming through this time. Seriously. Saw something weird. Oh, there's a guy mm -hmm. running. I'm going to write that plate down. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, the FBI traced the van but it led to someone else, someone that had sold it recently. Of course, then they knew who it was sold mm -hmm. to. When they tracked down the buyer, they found their pungent pilferer and brought his smelly crimes to an end. Donald Pardue and one of the tellers successfully picked the man from a photo lineup. Thankfully, it was a photo lineup, Danielle, and not a smelling yeah, lineup like exactly. we talked about. <laughs> yes. Could have been Robert, rough for everybody. Right. <laughs> Robert Harper Norris was a 45-year-old self-employed carpenter and pleaded guilty to robbing three of the banks in a plea deal where the prosecutors agreed not to go after him for the other robberies. He was sentenced to five years and 10 months in prison and had to repay the money from the three banks that he did admit to robbing. Uh, that was a little shy of about $3,000, meaning he essentially got to keep money from the other bank robberies, which was eight or nine other robberies. Interesting. That's an yeah. interesting way to go about that. But yeah, I was a little surprised too. Also, Danielle, the guy's name, his real name was Robert. The FBI was calling Bob. him Bob from the start. Literally perfect. They're good. They know what they're doing. <laughs> like they're professionals. Ha yeah. However, <laughs> despite Robert Norris being in police custody, the body odor bandit would strike again the oh. same year. It was 1991, late 1991, when a string of robberies started in Oklahoma, but this time it wasn't banks. It wasn't stores like the 1966 Bob. It was restaurants. This new body odor bandit had hit between seven and 15 different restaurants within a three month span. And he wasn't only known for his quote, unusually foul body smell, <laughs> but, Witnesses also recalled his dirty teeth. You're joking. <laughs> like yeah. people pick up on stuff like that 
very frequently, like people, we notice people's appearances and smells and this, yeah. that, and the other more than most things. So if you're going to go and rob a bank or, you know, rob a restaurant, blend in, come on, brush yeah. your teeth. Like <laughs> you're your sticking teeth. out like a sore thumb. I'm just being honest. It's just oh. the truth. Apparently he would go into the restaurant and he would order food. He would eat it using his dirty teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and then on his way out, he would rob the register showing them a gun, just flashing a little gun. Give me what's in the register. I'm out of here. The police used information from witnesses to eventually track down Thomas Allen Bevan, who thankfully was using a fake gun for those robberies. However, law enforcement soon announced that Thomas either had another aromatic accomplice or a cologne-free copycat. Several mm -hmm. witnesses from some of the robberies could not pick him out of a photo lineup. The strange thing is that the MO was exactly the same. So either Thomas was training someone or yeah. they were able to pick up the MO from the news coverage. Thomas was held on $50,000 uh, bail, but I couldn't find any news on what happened with his charges mm -hmm. or if he even went to trial. But that's not the end, Danielle. No. You know, someone they always, oh yeah. And we haven't, I, I'm surprised we're not talking about Florida here, but you know, they always go bigger in Texas. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the Lone Star State has had not one, but two BO bandits. In July of 2019, 19, or no, 2014, sorry, 19 year old Frisco resident Daniel Allen would take on the name when he robbed a Wells Fargo bank, also using a note. Witnesses said that the smelly suspect had a nervous demeanor and a strong body odor. There were also cameras all over the bank and plenty of pictures for police to use to identify and find him, even though he was wearing a hat and glasses. They gave pictures to the press asking for help, and soon the public helped identify Daniel. Daniel would plead guilty and was sentenced to 52 months in prison, followed by two years of supervised release. He was released in 2020, but would take things even further with the odors than any previous Bob ever did. He was asked to come into the parole office for some random drug testing. While they were collecting his specimen, they noticed, hey, looks like Daniel soiled his pants. Apparently, he oh. was wearing a device that contained clean urine to help him pass his drug test, and the device malfunctioned, spreading smelly pee-pee all over Daniel's clothing. <laughs> oh my goodness. Bad luck, man. <laughs> Let I me believe, just tell you. That's I believe awful. it's called... Yeah, I believe it's called a wizenator, but it's essentially a fake member yeah, that yeah. you store clean pee in. And uh, I guess the, <laughs> the, the faucet <laughs> on it must have not been working right. <laughs> the spigot. <laughs> <laughs> so they noticed. They said, okay, now you're going to have to give us an actual sample. He did, and he tested positive for marijuana, cocaine, and amphetamine. The court was petitioned to take him back to prison for an additional eight months and then to restart his two years of supervised release oh, all man. over again. <clears throat> so smelly Daniel and his poor cellmates. Yeah. The most recent person to try to move the legend of the body odor bandit forward did so just a few months ago. And you may have noticed that all the previous Bobs were men. Much like the new Black Panther, the new body odor bandit is a woman. It was December 19th, 2022, around 8.30 p.m., when a woman wearing a black baseball cap, a black coat, a camouflage face mask, and sunglasses walked into the lobby of a hotel in Hidalgo, Texas. She handed a note to the clerk that demanded money and stated that another person was standing outside of the hotel with a weapon. The clerk handed over the cash and the woman left, but her body odor stayed behind for a bit. <laughs> Things lingered for a while. Yeah. One witness said that the woman dressed nicely, even wearing some nice high heels, but she smelled heavily of body odor. Oh, good grief. On December 20th, she struck again, this time at a Schlotsky's sandwich shop. December oh, 21st. Oh, really? I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I haven't. We don't have them out here, at least not that I've seen. Uh, December 21st, another hotel, this time at JW Marriott. Getting into her groove on December 23rd, she stepped it up a bit and she hit Prosperity Bank, once again using the threatening note. 
This time, though, they noticed that she fled in a dark-colored sedan, and in all yeah. cases, they noted her body odor. <laughs> and soon, both Texas and federal authorities were on the case. In another first for B.O. Bandits Everywhere, she would actually get a second nickname. In a tweet posted by FBI Houston, they said, we're nicknaming her the High Heeled Hijacker. Help us get her in jail slides soon. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's got to be a feat of some sort <laughs> to have two names tied on to. Oh, like yeah. That. Well, it was weird because she only wore high heels in two of the robberies. But, yeah. you know, the FBI had used B.O. Bandit previously, so they gave her a different name. But the press <laughs> was way more focused on on the B.O. issue. Um, and why does the FBI do this nicknaming thing? A spokeswoman told the New York Post, we learned very quickly it's a smart tactic to give them names because the public latches on to them. Exactly. Yeah. With plenty of pictures and even video of some of these robberies, law enforcement once again reached out to the media for help. And on January 19th, 2023, due to a tip from the public, she was identified and caught. 58-year-old Lisa Marie Coleman was charged with three counts of robbery. I believe she's been charged for the ones where they have clear pics yeah. and footage, but I think she's only a suspected of the sandwich shop robbery. But uh, she now faces a kidnapping charge for an oh, earlier wow. crime. <laughs> Okay, then. Yeah. Escalated a little bit. Stinking it up. It was back in November of 2022. It was November 15th when a woman named Katie Oten was leaving work at a local mall. She says, I was putting stuff into my vehicle and this woman just kind of appeared out of nowhere behind me. Mm -mm. She was like, I have a gun and give me all your money. So she sees this woman, the high-heeled B.O.er, was holding something in her pocket that looked like a gun but was probably, Katie thinks, is probably just her index finger. Like she was holding it in the shape of a gun, but she she wasn't going to mess with it. So Katie handed over $100. She told her, that's all I have. And she was like, empty your purse. You have to have money. You have to have more money. I was like, I don't have any money because I don't carry cash. She then forced Katie to drive her to several ATMs to try to withdraw more money. They oh, drove her, gross. Yeah, yeah. Ew. They drove around for nearly 30 minutes stopping at four ATMs with the robber demanding that Katie withdraw $2,000. Poor Katie stuck in a vehicle with the BO bandit for a half an hour being driven to these different places. And the impression I'm getting is that Katie didn't have any money in her account because they're yeah. going to all these different ATMs. And I only ever hear basically Katie gave her the hundred dollars that she had that she knew about when the BO bandit asked for her to check her purse, she found another 60. So she gave her 160 in total. And that's the only total that I ever hear of in the coverage on this. Um, but Katie did figure out a way to get some fresh air and escape the situation. She convinced yeah. the robber that she could get more cash if they went to a grocery store ATM. Why that logic worked, I don't know. But uh, She's so, like, oh yeah, sounds, sounds about right. Let's try. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's something wrong with these ATMs. Let's go to the store. So once she got into the store, they both went in together. Katie basically then refused to leave. Quote, I Good. told her I wasn't going to leave Randall's pharmacy and grocery with her. I told her, you have the car keys, take the car, go and do whatever you want. So the bandit left with Katie's phone, keys, and the $160 that I mentioned, but thankfully did leave Katie behind at the store. Katie would find her car still in the parking lot later. She called authorities, but thought police were never going to find the woman that kidnapped and robbed her. She was very happy to hear about Lisa's arrest a few months later. Law enforcement is actually looking for any other victims of Lisa's. Oh my gosh. Run of musty misconduct. <laughs> Good grief. She was just on one, leaving her yeah. trail everywhere. Yeah. And according to some early court documents on this case, Lisa has already admitted to the kidnapping incident. Her bond has been set at $300,000. What was her motive? Prosecutor Chandler Rain with the Harris County District Attorney's Office said, pretty much anytime you have someone taking money from somebody else, one of your motives is going to be greed. Ms. Coleman decided that something that was somebody else's, she had a greater right to possess it. And this mm -hmm. is a case that's still in process with another court date coming up in April. So I do just want to remind everyone, we have to remember that Lisa Coleman is to be considered innocent until proven funky. Yeah, exactly. Thank, <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Thank you, San Angelo Standard Times, Cleveland Clinic, North County Times, the Fresno Bee, the Los Angeles Times, Boca Raton. Boca Raton. Is that how you say that? See, I don't know. I'm Boca Raton, I think. I think news. so. I think, yeah. The the Oklahoman, the Dallas Morning News, Casetext.com, click to Houston.com, ABC 13, Fox 26 News, Local Today News, the New York Post. The research went on and on and on. I even stopped by uh chat G. PT or whatever, the new chat mm -hmm. AI that everyone's using. And I asked it, I, I told it, I'm looking for names for smelly criminals. And Danielle, it lectured me. No, uh Yes, it did. It's like, you know, it's really not polite to be calling people names, even criminals. And, you know, no person is any one act that they ever do. I was like, what? The, what? I'm just asking for. So I told it, I, I'm some like, research, please. I, I know. I told it. I'm like, well, okay, this is actually for a, a fictional piece that I'm writing. And it was like, okay. I guess, I'll, I guess I'll figure this out. It did. It did. It was like, okay. I did not like that. Well, since you told me that this was for fiction, then here's some some titles I came up with. <laughs> and it gave me oh. a list of 10. So here's, here's some other names that I was trying to work into the script, but they didn't quite fit. The Fumigator, Stenchmaster. The Odor Bandit, it almost came up with with yeah, Bob. Exactly. Uh, Funk Felon. Funk Felon. That has to be my favorite one so far. The Smell Razor. Oh my goodness. Noxious Offender. The Aroma Assassin. <laughs> Stinky Steve. The Perfume Pilferer. And the Cologne Criminal. <laughs> oh my goodness. Look, I love here's that. the thing. Here's the thing. No, it's not great to comment on someone's body odor in a way that makes them feel bad about themselves. But when you have yeah. a crime and you are trying to identify someone mm -hmm. and the very obvious thing that they leave behind is their body odor. Yeah. What are you supposed to do? Yeah. Ignore it. Well, I just, <laughs> just want to give like, a warning to any FBI agents that think, hey, we can yeah. use that chat GPT or GTP, whatever it is, to, to come up with our clever side, names. Yeah. yeah, it's not going to help you guys unless you tell it that this is for fiction. There's there's your hint. Tell it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Good grief. Oh, goodness. Well, Danielle, as always, we've gotten through our big stories, but we have other ones worth spending a little time on. And I got to hear... Mm -hmm. One of those from you. What do you got for us? All right, you guys. Now, listen, I feel like most of the stories that I came across, it was criminals themselves, you know, smelling bad or doing something to smell bad. <laughs> you know, like they're, or they cause the smell, you know what I mean? But this one kind of turns the tables and I almost feel like it's karma. It's like the criminal the universe just has to have a last laugh, you know? Mm -hmm. So August, 2020 in Spokane at County, Washington, the sheriff's received a call that there was a burglary in progress at a local church in Deer Park. So like, a, it's like a big open area. There's a big old church. We're not talking in the middle of the woods, anything like that. And that will come into play. And then the caller was informing them, look, there's a guy, he's in the church. We can see him on the cameras. He's got a mask on. He's looking at all of our audio equipment. And you guys, stuff like that is expensive. And so they're like, we need someone there to prevent him from taking it. And so officers, three in the morning, head to this church and they see this man walking inside and he gets to a window where he obviously sees them too. And so he starts to flee and he's jumping out of this window. Police are, you know, running right up to him to stop him, They're cornering him. He's like on this sidewalk right beside this parking lot. And they're like, hands up, get on the ground. As he's starting to do that, like out of absolutely nowhere comes a skunk. <laughs> Just like, like is this out a of Warner a Brothers cartoon? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like fall out of a window in like a tar pit or like, no, like, <laughs> no, just a skunk at three in the morning in this like very built up area comes running around the corner of the church, directly running towards this perpetrator, sprays it, runs off. Wow. Wow. Nails and the everyone's perpetrator. everyone's just like, what? <laughs> Like, what just happened? Yeah. Now, he ended up getting sprayed 
28-year-old 28 28-year-old 28 Grant Simpson ended up being arrested, or Simonson, not Simpson, um, and charged with second-degree burglary. And mm. I cannot imagine what that car ride to jail was like to oh, book him. Yeah. Because, I mean, freshly sprayed with skunk. And he couldn't even go anywhere because he was being told by police, like, hands up, get on the ground. And all of a sudden, he is cornered by a skunk. Mm. Mm. absolutely nightmare and now he told authorities look I, I didn't mean anything bad i wasn't going you know i was just bored it's literally what he said he was like i was bored and i am literally willing to bet he will never make a mistake like that again that is like the universe being like you need to go back home yeah <laughs> seriously. seriously go back home insult to injury here <sighs> yeah they should uh they should deputize that skunk that's what i think mm -hmm. hire hire that skunk as a matter of fact that kind of leans into my story pretty well. Now, earlier I told the story of some of the worst smelling criminals. What about bad smelling law enforcement, like Deputy Skunk over there? Mm -hmm. It was 2003 and a team of sheriff's deputies were having trouble in Compton, California. An abandoned Compton motel had turned into a breeding ground for drug dealers, prostitution, and gangs. Quote, people were coming and going to use narcotics. One part of it had even been burned down because they were using candles to light the place. It oh, was boy. dangerous, said Lieutenant Sean Mathers, who, Danielle, you're much too young to know this, but he's the brother of actor and Leave It to Beave It star Jerry Mathers. Oh, okay. And Lieutenant Mathers came up with a plan that actually sounds like something from an old sitcom. He found a synthetic product online called Skunk Shot. It's used by gardeners and ranchers to repel animals. And now Lieutenant Mathers was using it to repel crime. Oh he, my goodness. He planted skunk shot all over the abandoned building after it had been cleared out by police personnel. Then he came back to check on it a few hours later, still empty. A few days later, still empty <laughs> quote after five or six days you can still smell it we even got in a battle of smells with the folks there they were bringing cans of glade and scented candles but are you that serious stuff, yeah that stuff just can't compete he would tell oh, the absolutely press. Not. <laughs> oh and, man so that is how what is been referred to as the skunk squad was born and Lieutenant Mathers would actually go on to be hired by the owner of Skunk Shot to be their North American spokesperson. And at one point, even the military reached out to him asking about its possible use in war zone areas. And he's got this whole story, which I don't want to go into it too much because it doesn't sound like it's very plausible to me. Oh, no. But apparently he was contacted by the military right before um, the capture of Saddam Hussein. <clears throat> And oh, buddy. Yeah, they're they're thinking he's it seems like there's some angle where they think maybe oh, they boy. used the skunk squad approach to to have Saddam crawl what a out legacy, of his hole. Man. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I mean, Hussein, I said, yeah, Saddam Hussein. Oh, yeah. I haven't said that name in a long time. I know. God. I know. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Skunk squad. That sounds like something teenagers. Mm -hmm. would come up with and do yeah and i kind of love the fact that it worked so well <laughs> yeah yeah cleared that building out it sure did oh my goodness all right now this one may or may not be one of my favorites so uh oh cereal the cereal pooper very serious here don't okay. tell that to the ai machine yeah <laughs> November 7th, 2018, police in Simsbury, Connecticut were called from a concerned citizen worried about some serious criminal activity. Okay. Okay. Now, this man, I don't even know. They called him some certain name. I, I don't know if it's like a mem like a, someone from an HOA or something. I didn't even bother looking it up, but he oversees a neighborhood to some sure. extent. And he's like, look. There's something going on in my neighborhood. I've been getting calls from people because in this undeveloped cul-de-sac in our neighborhood, we're finding signs of crime. Do you know what those signs are? Well, Needles say... and poop. Ooh, what? <laughs> Just like two very random specific things. Needles and poop. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and like, look. I grew up in Durham, North Carolina. If anyone's watching this, if you know, you know. Okay, that's uh, literally an average occurrence or a normal occurrence here. Okay, right. walk down there's, the street. 
Needle, there's nothing poop. abnormal. I, I'm, I <laughs> wish I was joking. <clears throat> and so authorities are like, oh, crime. And so they rush to the scene of this, right? And they're like, you know what? This is not animal feces. This is human feces. And what's even more disturbing, I kid you not, this is in all the reports. They said, we didn't find any toilet paper. Oh, no. <laughs> the way that it said. They're like, we found the poop and there was not there was... a shred of toilet paper. <laughs> Come Anywhere. on, no leaves? Nothing? Absolutely not. And so after oh. a few more incidents, they get another call. And they're like, you know what? We got to take care of the serial pooper. It keeps happening. This person has to be stopped. So on November 16th, a motion activated camera was put in place. <laughs> I wish that there was <laughs> such little crime in my area that this is what the focus was on. I really yeah, did. seriously, seriously. Motion activated camera was put in place in hopes of identifying the suspect. And so they sat and they waited. And sure enough, on December 5th, the criminal hit again. And all they saw was this car pull into the cul-de-sac. Someone got off on the other side of the camera. Couldn't really tell who it was. Got back in the car. Car drives off. There's a pile of poop. What the heck? I know. And so then, again, with all their free time, because there's apparently no actual, like, serious crime in the area, they start, like, sitting around this entire area waiting to find this car. Like, waiting for it to pass by. They're staking it out. They are. They're literally staking it out. And sure enough, they end up seeing a car that matches from the video and they perform a traffic stop and they're like apparently expecting some big criminal i don't even know it's like they were investigating like a serial killer the way that it is described in these articles wow but no 43 year old holly malone a nice woman lived three miles away from the scene of the crime <laughs> what why drive home it's three <laughs> miles so holly was brought in for questioning and she was embarrassed and she's like this was an accident. It was a one-time thing. I am lactose intolerant. I couldn't make it home or to my destination. I had to pull over and do this. And like, you know what? I feel like we've all had moments like that. You know, it's just, sure. you know, it happens. Sure. But they're like, Holly, this isn't one time. This yeah. isn't even two times. <laughs> like you have repeatedly gone to this exact same cul-de-sac and taking a crap in the middle of it and she proceeds to apologize and she's like you know what sometimes i'm just quote stupid and indulge in dairy anyways and you know it just uh, it is what it is does her ex-husband live there or something honestly i wonder yeah she apologized she like a million times she was charged a second degree breach of peace and ensured the police that she would not ever poop on the street again but when i tell you right now i know for a fact there was some sort of satisfaction in whatever she was doing there has to be yeah yeah, there's some reason. Like, I get, like, la being lactose intolerant is awful. Like, I am somewhat sensitive to dairy, and that's not even, like, and it's yeah. awful, and that's not even lactose intolerant. And, like, there, it, it sucks. But you are not about to try to convince me that the same time, multiple times in a month, you just so happen to eat something that just so happens to hit you right at this cul-de-sac. <laughs> right. Like, Maybe this is just the way they get like experience thrill in this area. Like there's no crime. They've got to that's, create it. That's kind of what I was thinking. Like, is does she have a thing about wanting to go to the bathroom in the outdoors or something? I don't know. You know what? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But it, maybe in the woods. <laughs> like, it could, I don't even know. An absolute nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Phil Atito wasn't happy, Daniel. It was last year at a council meeting in Maryland. The council was trying to pass a bill that created a police accountability board, a board that didn't involve an already existing coalition for police accountability that was actually run by the public and a hundred local organizations looking for change. So Phil wanted to make a statement. He showed up at the council meeting in a poop emoji costume. Oh my gosh. And he read his statement congratulating the council on sh passing a shiny turd of a bill, a turd that will come back and haunt them because when you lay a turd, it stinks. These are his words, Daniel. When you pass a whopper of a turd, the stink lingers, he concluded, really tapping the joke out as far as he possibly could. <laughs> or did he? 
After giving his speech, he went back to his seat, but Mm -mm. something wasn't right. Nope. Within a few moments, you could see council members start leaving. An announcement is made over the speakers that there is a smell in the room, but Phil just sits there until the deputies walk over to him. They found that Phil had an empty glass vial with a label on it that read stink bomb. Oh my gosh. He had poured liquid poo all over himself in the poop costume. Now that's getting into character. It absolutely is. I was about to say there is a very high level of dedication to this entire thing so far. Absolutely. Like he, I mean, it wasn't enough. I, there's no. footage of all this and I listened to his whole speech and he just, he taps the joke and taps the joke. I mean, just you're wore out by the end it of in. it. Yeah. You're <laughs> like, okay, guy, we get it. You, you think this thing's a turd. We get it. But then he goes and sits down. Cops He's come over. He's to himself the whole time. She'll be like, <laughs> yeah, room. I'm so yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the chambers were cleared and Phil became a headline. He was also offered medical treatment because apparently he was having trouble breathing with the stink bomb <laughs> all over him and him cooped up in the poop costume. <laughs> he was charged with disorderly conduct and disturbing the peace. <laughs> I'm telling you, I feel like this has come back to bite almost every single person. Yeah. Uh, it's just not a good situation. Good grief. No. no, these are some of the fiercest criminals that we've ever covered on this show. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and Danielle, <laughs> I'm wondering, who's going to win this month? Honestly, this is going to be interesting because I feel like we had very, very different stories again. I and do too. both of them were an absolute nightmare. Mm-hmm. And I honestly am shocked when it comes to your story that there are so many people living out the exact same thing. <laughs> it is over weird. Over and over again. It's weird that the MO was the same for most of them too. That yeah. most of them are handing over a note. They're usually actually unarmed, but they smell. Really they leave bad. that smell behind. I'm like, it, did you all like get together and like plan this? Is there like a Reddit thread somewhere where you're all like right. discussing doing this? And like taking tips off of each other. Like what is what is happening here? Honestly, yeah. I don't know you guys, but it's not up to us. You guys get to vote. Who told the best law and odor story? And you can vote for the first seven days at our Twitter account at Crime After Pod. Or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We also have a link in the description box if you're watching on YouTube. Or if you're watching, you can also click the little eye in the corner. At Crime After Crime Podcast, you'll find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to join our Patreon, and shop our Teespring store. And as always, a massive thank you to our patrons. You guys Thanks, are guys. absolutely awesome. We love getting to hang out with you because we have bonus Patreon special segments monthly where you get just a whole bunch of learning about me and John and crazy stories. Plus, mm-hmm. our patrons also get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. And don't forget, you can come and meet us, plus attend our final episode at CrimeCon Orlando in September of 2023. Come and meet up with us for the big finale, you guys. And how do you get your name on the guest list and a bunch of free crime after crime swag? I'm here to tell you, visit CrimeCon.com and buy a standard CrimeCon pass today using the code CRIMEAFTERCRIME with no spaces. And then you take that, email your receipt to CRIMEAFTERCRIME at LordAndArts.com. That's CRIMEAFTERCRIME at L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S.com. The sooner the better. We do have a limited number of seats and swag, and we don't want you guys to miss out. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. Absolutely. And of course, we'll be back with another episode for you guys next month. What's the topic? It's one that you selected from when we did the polls, the audience Mm -hmm. pick world's worst alibi part two. That's going to be a good one, you guys. Absolutely. I kind of felt in my bones that was going to be the one that people would pick. Kind of. All right, you guys, this show is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Helen, and the always amazing John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. Have a great month, you guys, and we'll see you again soon on Crime After Crime. Bye-bye. <laughs>